As the Demics blazed a trail as one of the country's first punk bands, punk grabbed a foothold in the city's conservative landscape. First they performed at local underground galleries and neighborhood lofts. Then they settled in at a couple of bars downtown. The London Free Press didn't miss the excesses. There's beer constantly being swilled and uh, one of the original stories in the London Free Press was about the Demics playing at New York. It was something like, uh, Demics rock out and sell tides of beer. And that's what it was, you know, it was just like And beer was a lot cheaper back then than it is now. And I ended up going to the Cedar Lounge and hanging out in the tourist section because I didn't dress up, so I wasn't allowed in the regular section. I was afraid to go in at first because I'd never seen a bar that crowded. Like people standing up. In regular bars, you didn't stand up. You sat at your table with your beer. You couldn't walk around with your beer. You were stuck there. And at the Cedar, it was totally different. You could walk around with a beer. You could jump up and down. You could be crazy. Well, the, the Cedar Lounge was on two levels. The main level with the stage and the dance floor was the biggest part, and then just off to the to the left was about three steps up where the bathrooms were. There was a section where the tourists sat and you know, that's what we were referred to and we were just sort of there to watch the action. And I believe I walked into the bar with a, a head full of hair, an afro hairdo and my moccasins on. <laughs> and you know, my really wide jeans and things and I was totally a tourist and out of place. And yet when I walked in, I just fell in love with the atmosphere, the, the um, way that, you know, it was wild. I mean, people were slam dancing, the teens were loud, and people were having a great time. And we, nobody seemed to really care about what the other guy was doing. I mean, it was very, sort of an independent kind of way, and, and that struck me right there. I liked it. I definitely belonged in the tourist section, but I fell in love with it right away and um, just sort of, I, I went, I just like cut my hair off, short. And I went to the hairdresser and it's like, it's not short enough, it needs to be shorter, shorter, shorter. My pants, they need to be tighter and <laughs> they need to be peg legs and you know, the sneakers and the whole nine yards because I knew that that's where I personally wanted to be and where um, I think I belonged at the time. Well, there was the art community, then the social misfits, and misfits from college, univers uh, college and university, they all got together. And it seemed like we all got together, and for a while, we were on, all on the same playing field. Everybody was constantly mingling, talking, and, you know, having a laugh, and, and if you wanted to dance, you just went on the dance floor and started dancing. I do remember seeing the, the Demics and pogoing and slam dancing with everybody and, you know, just sort of the I want to go to New York City thing, you know, just sort of dancing along and slamming and, you know, it, it was great because you'd slam off your friends and, I mean, the dance was really quite unusual. <laughs> the first image I saw of the Demics was Keith Whitaker diving off the stage face first into the crowd to go after someone who he was not too happy with. The band didn't miss a note and kept going and you just looked around that place and just saw all this interactive energy. Keith um, was a great promoter for the band. He was constantly talking about the band and the music. Hey, I've got this great band, come down and see us. But that's what Keith was always like, you know, he was always, man, you gotta see this. Forget about that other music, come down here and see us and stuff, you know, so it was great that way. Like he started the whole scene. It basically, you know, that one guy created the whole scene that, you know, spread out into all these different bands. They weren't um, professional musicians by any standards, that's for sure. They were just out there to have fun. They were us on the stage, basically. They were the kids that went to see the shows, and first thing you know, they're, they've graduated to the stage. And they had a great time, and so did we. Acts like Wayne County and Eddie and the Hot Rods toured through London, while the Demics and Uranus played the local clubs and began to push the envelope. The band I saw in London that I really liked was Uranus, and that was at the Cedar Lounge. They were a rock and roll band, something that you didn't see anywhere else. They were playing song, rockabilly songs that you didn't hear on the radio, you had to go digging to find. 
They were playing Johnny Burnett and the Rock and Roll Trio. I'd never heard any band play that. I was just blown away from it, with them. And because of the Uranus, I, I kept going back to the Cedar Lounge. And then finally I got into the punk stuff. The music just grabbed me right away. I liked it. I loved it. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard. To me, it was um, a rebirth of rock and roll. All the pretension was gone. The 20-minute solos were gone. The, the ridiculous drum solos were gone. It was rock and roll stripped down to the bare bones. Hey, man, we're going to play some old, old punk rock for you. Back then, the heavy metal bands would have, like Led Zeppelin would have 10 minute, 20 minute drum solos. You can go outside, smoke a joint, come back in, and the drum solo still wouldn't be done. Like, give me a break. The, a punk band could have played 10 songs in that time. I just watch the Ramones, they, they did it every night. We were coming off a really bad time in music because it was like prog rock, it was a disco, and a lot of you know music that was not at the time considered very cool, and it was like, I don't know, the general feeling is that punk kind of kicked rock and roll music in the pants again and got it to be like it should have been back in the 50s, you know, it was like rebellious, uh, with scared parents, you know, it was uh, Satan's music. If it's three chords, that's great. Like, people understand three chords. Like, look at country. It survived on three chords forever. And it's so popular. It's so popular. But people relate to three chords, there's no doubt about it. The Ramones are still great today after a zillion years. They took music matters into their own hands, led by the example of those who came before. The principal bond was the music, its intensity and simplicity, and its open invitation to the audience for participation. October 1978, Halloween, the Polish Hall, the Demix, the Pop-Tarts, the Sophisticados, it was my first punk rock show. Somebody kicked open the side door and about 30 of us ran in. Life was never the same again. Now it seems so, so easy. There's a do-it-yourself mentality. But back then, you guys, everybody's just going, the endemics were cool and we were all hanging out and everything. And then, and then they go, well, why don't you put a band together? And I go, well, I, I don't know how to play guitar. I can't play drum. He goes, that doesn't matter. You know, you know, you, you think, you know, like uh, it's got to be like Sticks or like Queen, you got to be Brian May, right? Like you got to be able to, or you got to be Eddie Van Halen to be in a band, right? And then these guys are going, no, you, you don't have to be. We were all just learning our instruments and I was really crappy and everything, but I just kept, we sort of locked ourselves in a room and I just kept going at it for a good year or so anyhow and it started to sound all right. I can remember the very first rehearsal, I came over with the 26er and got liquored out of my head and uh, they did too, and the drum kit was just a piece of total crap. It had string holding the foot pedal together, and, but it didn't really matter because I couldn't play anyhow, so I just kind of hacked away at it, and we just had a good time. Basically, that was about it. You know, I didn't learn from Joe Satriani or anything. I'm just up there doing it. You know, I can make a bar chord, or I can pluck, or I can hit some stuff. It's just get up there and do it. And if anyone turn around and say, well, you guys suck, well, get up and do better. So there was uh, Scott Bentley and myself, I was playing drums, and uh, Bob Glidden on bass, and a guy by the name of Larry Gifford on guitar, and uh, we rehearsed in uh, Scott Bentley's uh, parents, what, well, his dad's uh, basement of, of, of his house. And I remember uh, Bob Bentley coming down the stairs one evening, you know, covering his ears <laughs> with a big cigar and his mouth just shaking his head. My brother and my parents, they've always played around the house. And they had parties and the guitars came out. My mother sang, my brother played too. And my dad plays every stringed instrument on the planet, so it sort of sunk in a bit. I was writing a lot of songs too. I, I started writing almost as soon as I started playing. So that was yet another form of liberation, you know, and finding your creativity. and and finding out, you know, things about yourself, really. What you like and what you don't like, and, uh, and music was my escape, I guess, from things I didn't like in life. 